very large volumes of crystalloid vis-a-vis -vis colloids, what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages, and I think a lot of us are left confused at the end of the day. But we know one thing, that fluids are needed in cases of either anticipated or unanticipated severe blood loss following either burns, sepsis, surgery, trauma, or anything that has led to shock, whether it is vasodilatory shock or hemorrhagic shock. So especially when there has been a large loss of blood and fluid. And it is in this context that the volume is required to be replaced so that we can maintain the oxygen delivery. Now, we know that volume expansion is also occurring in case of spinal anesthesia and when we are doing acute normal volumic hemodilution. We also do it for the uh, planned uh, hemodilution, but mostly we are using it for acute normal volumic hemodilution. And in certain therapeutic conditions, we use crystalloids and colloids like conditions of stroke. So we would want an ideal fluid that is not going to cause any reaction, that is not going to lead to the problems with elimination by the kidneys, that are not going to change the protein and oncotic status. And we knew that we wanted to optimize oxygen delivery so it would continue to maintain the oxygen and the carbon dioxide transport, and it would avoid hyperglycemia. And very importantly, if it did not cause any suppression or activation of inflammation and coagulation. And very importantly, having an ideal fluid would be useless if we don't have it when we need it. And we were talking about costs of factor seven, etc. If it is very expensive, it would be useless. Many of the textbooks, when you read them, I think sometimes you might have wondered, they're talking of albumin. We don't know why even today they keep talking about albumin. And I firmly believe it's not a suspicion. Now for you, it may be a suspicion. For me, you know, I am a hardcore extremist guy. I believe it is a company pressure that forces people to conduct research to establish good points of albumin irrespective of the point or fact that it has got a good incidence of anaphylactic reactions. It is horribly expensive and does the same work. You would not buy a car at 50 lakhs if the same purpose and work that you needed to do was going to be sufficed with 5 lakhs. You would consider it a waste of money, so we should also consider it a waste of money with albumin. I'm making this statement at the very outset so that I can have five people raising hands and fighting with me. So we have two issues, which fluid to be used. We are worried about the intracellular volume, about the extracellular volume, the permeability under certain septic conditions, under shock states, that is going to be the barrier between the movement of these fluids and how much to use. The issues to consider would be are we using it for resuscitation? Is that the indication? Whether blood would be more useful than plasma or in, the, uh, in considering the amount of the fluid that has been lost, the blood that has been lost. And during resuscitation, do we want to fill up so much? You see, Professor Shoemaker introduced the concept in, during shock about using high volumes and the oxygen flux that was associated with it. There were a lot of criticisms, and ultimately the European school uh, won out, and uh, most of the time uh, we try to have a medium uh, equation at that. But the timing of the resuscitation with fluids is very important. It's always important to be early rather than late. And we have to actually anticipate it adequately well in time, and also know what are the indications we are using it for. We start filling, it with, uh, filling the uh, patient with fluids and then realize that we are going to use a vasopressor, and then we have an immediate cardiac overload. So we have to have an idea what we are going to do, and monitoring 
of the resuscitation with the appropriate endpoints, whether the gas transfer is being satisfied, whether the lactate levels are going down, whether the microcirculation has been helped. These are the points that we'll have to keep in mind. I think I mentioned in my previous lecture also that in the 1940s, it was told that salt is bad and therefore huge amounts of salt restrictions, only 5% dextrose. Even today, many surgeons continue in, across the disciplines to practice this. We are every day trying to educate them to change their ways. And I have been called a number of times to treat, within inverted commas, intractable convulsions, not responding to high doses of anticonvulsants, only to find that the sodium was 100 or 97 or 110. So then gradually the change started occurring that it was realized that patients do need salt and fluids. And gradually it became established that, no, they will be needing fluids and uh, that they needed salt. So the balanced concept of fluid resuscitation came up. Is it only to be colloids? It is only to be crystalloids? Or is it going to be some co-colloid or co-crystalloid to be administered with one as a major component, one as the other? If a patient has come to you, the very rational things come, if a patient has come to you with severe amount of blood loss, initially, from the intracellular space, the blood volume would be filled up by drawing on the fluid from the cells from the interstitial spaces. So this patient is now basically dry. And you give the patient colloid at the very beginning, and where will it fill up? It is supposed to expand the volume, so it is going to what? Draw further fluid from an already dry interstitial space, from an already dry cell. So it would be rational to first give in a lot of fluids, say 20 milliliter per kg at least. Then if you give a small amount of colloid, it has some fluid to draw from the cells to quickly expand the vascular space. But giving it in the beginning would cause more harm than good. Now we are not talking about whether colloid should be the primary thing. Basically, it is coming as a helper to the crystalloid that has been given. At the same time, what type of crystalloid to use? When we use large volumes, in small volumes it doesn't matter much, but when you use large volumes, you know that the sodium chloride has got more than 150, I mean, it's around 153 milliequivalents of the sodium, a chloride, and then this amount, when you're giving in large volumes, two liters, it is going to add to the acidosis, which itself is going to cause damage under conditions of sepsis and shock. So you would like today an idea of a balanced fluid resuscitation concept. So balanced colloids are needed aside from balanced crystallites. So if you are having giving fluid therapy, what are you giving it for? Are you giving it for resuscitation? Are you giving it for maintenance? If you're giving it for resuscitation, as I mentioned, you're using the crystalloid and then filling it up with colloids so that the vascular space can draw on some of the fluids that you have given earlier on. So it will be very useful in this manner to replace the acute losses from hemorrhage or GI losses, third space loss, etc. In the post-operative period, in patients who have had a lot of dissection, say patients who have undergone Whipples and other uh, uh, third, uh, where a lot of soft tissue has been damaged. A small finger, if it is trapped in the car door, and you just you take it out and it swells. It swells. It's very painful, but it's limited amount of swelling because of the tough skin. Where has it drawn the fluid? It has drawn the fluids from the other space. Now they have expanded. But when we do an extensive dissection of the lymph nodes throughout the abdomen, and then we expect that there will be only one or two liters of fluid requirement, no. These are all going to expand without the limit of this hard cutaneous layer. So in the post-operative period, if you are not watching your central venous pressure, if you are not giving large amount of fluids, you will find your patient is going to have a low urine output, a low blood pressure, a low CVP, and ultimately, as things go on drifting like this for some time, the cellular, at the microcircularity level, you will find that they are not having good circulation, acidosis starts to develop. So you have to remember that edema, after extensive dissection, third space loss, what we are talking, it is not just something exotic. This is why you are going to face the problem. And when we are talking of maintenance, well, if you are having 
uh, evaporative loss, the insensible uh, water loss, urine and fecal loss. So electrolytes and nutrition, the fluids with the nutrition, they are all that are needed. So the compensatory mechanism, what happens when there is a fluid in the blood vessels, the blood, there is a transcapillary pressure, the hydrostatic pressure tending to push out fluids, which is being trying and prevented by the colloid in the blood. At the same time, you have got the uh, uh, hydrostatic pressure in the interstitial space. So there will be a balance about how this is going to happen and how much will go out. Now, as we see, when the pressure, the intravascular pressure is rising, and then from the net reabsorption because of the colloids, as the hydrostatic pressure increases, you will find that gradually it will become in a condition where no absorption, no filtration, and as you cross it, net filtration, and you will have, say, collection of water in the lungs, interstitial, you are facing it in the ICU, the lung compliance starts dropping because the interstitial water logging has started occurring. So compensatory fluid shocks, as I told you, the patient was getting an hemorrhage, the, the patient started drawing fluid from the cells into the interstitium and into the plasma. And here you saw that the resetting of the resistance ratio led to half liter fluid going out into the plasma and from the glucose osmotic mechanism again half liter. So net effect of endogenous intravascular refill had been provided for by the movement across the cell to the plasma volume. And when we are giving crystalloids for plasma volume support, well, you are saying that if we have given over here one liter of crystalloid, then from that, the, the, uh, most of it, it has come to the interstitium, and then it has come to the interstitium, and you can see that the edema has developed. And it comes out much faster than it would have been with a colloid. Now, so there is an effect on the volume of distribution and the effect of the colloid on cortic pressure. And whenever we are giving lots of fluids, remember, we are using many drugs, and we sometimes think whether we have given a therapeutic level in the ICU every day, you are watching whether water logging in the patient is occurring. You are looking for fluid deficit, positive or negative, in every shift, then in every 24 hours. And then we tend to forget that, okay, in 24 hours, we had a 1,200 ml positive balance. We take out the nursing chart, Next day, fresh chart, we say we have got 800 ml positive balance, nothing much. Even after taking care of the 500 ml of insensible loss. Next day, we have 2,400 ml positive balance. Next day, we have 1,800 ml positive balance. We have crossed five liters of positive balance. And now this patient is gradually getting waterlogged more and more and more. I remember the picture when Kanshi Ram, when the leader of the BSP party was in Ames on ventilator for a very, very long time. When he ultimately died, when he was taken out, if you remember the photographs, his face was this big. And how many of you have seen patients in the ICU with very much water bloated? Then you are using drugs with volumes of distribution. The importance of this comes over here. You are using a drug with a low volume of distribution, say an antibiotic. You are giving an appropriate dose according to the creatinine clearance, and you have given the full dose in the appropriate timing intervals. But what has happened? A drug with low volume of distribution, when you have put it into a large fluid accumulation, it, the dose was calculated according to the patient's body weight and body fluid volume. Now with a five or seven liter, I have seen 22 liters positive balance. You must have seen, many of you must have seen, this is the truth. And this antibiotic has now been diluted and is now circulating. We are giving sub-therapeutic levels of antibiotics. Whether the resistance is developing because of your underdosing, you are giving the correct dose, but, or whether it is because the therapeutic level has fallen due to dilution. The importance of volume status is there. So every day you have to target and maintain your fluid balance within a narrow range. We do it eight hourly so that by the end of 24 hours, we are not too far behind. Because at the end of every eight hour, if we try to correct the negative or the positive balance, only then can we have a modicum of control. And we see the crystalloids stay in the circulation for a much 
less length of time and larger amounts of volume are required. But initially, crystalloids are needed in the case of a volume loss because without that, the colloids are going to draw out fluid from already dry tissues. So we see that when colloids are given, they are remaining in the plasma for a longer period of time. And then see with sodium chloride, 0.9%, they are going out into the interstitial space very quickly. And when we are using 5% dextrose, they have no salt to hold them back, and they are going into intracellular fluid. So based upon their composition, we can have isotonic equal sodium content, we can have hypotonic solutions, we can have hypertonic solutions. I have already mentioned the chloride, 154. So this is something you should keep in mind. So there are actually a huge number of good reasons for using crystalloids. And remember, they are good. I remember once upon a time, one of my teachers, he used to tell me, I use colloids because this company has decided to uh, support the lunch for the examiners. Otherwise, crystalloids are absolutely fine. He was trying to make a point. He was trying to make a point. He knew very well what he is talking. He was a very, very brilliant person. But he was trying to make the point that colloids are your mainstay. Hey, crystalloids are your mainstay. But colloids have a role, even at that time. So they, they use crystalloids because they're inexpensive and readily available, easy to store, and no adverse reactions, no compatibility testing. And a variety of formulations are available for your specific needs. But how many of you use a, a lot of fluids other than saline, ringolactate, and DNS? Tell me. How many use a lot of 5% dextrose? How many use only ringers? We use lactated ringers most of the time. But you see, we use two or three solutions most of the time. And you see, they are effective for use as interstitial replacement fluids. I think I made the statement from the very beginning. We are using them as interstitial replacement fluids or maintenance fluids. Now, the other side of the question comes, why not crystallize? Well, large volume is needed. You need time. How many of you put in 14 gauge cannulas during resuscitation? Hey, one hand at least come up. 18 gauge cannula. Nobody uses. What is the? Yes, one. Good. Thank you. You, how many of you use 18 gauge cannula? Chloride, 80 milliliter per hour. Bot one bottle, 540 ml. So how long will you take? The 180 ml in the 18 gauge, 16, sorry, 16 gauge, 180 ml, at least three minutes will be needed for you to take that fluid through. Depending, of course, that the height of the stand is proper, the arm is in the proper position, you have chosen a good caliber vein, not shown your technical skill, you're only just managing to slide one cannula into a very thin vein. So with so many things, you, your limitation, you want to give crystallize, you want to give a large volume, but your IV cannula, you yourself are not using 14-gauge cannulas. If nobody is using a 14-gauge cannula, where are you going to get that large volume in? So when you need a large volume, after the initial fluids, you will de facto have to come back to colloids. Otherwise, your patient will be hypovolemic for a long time. And it will also increase interstitial edema after you have crossed the interstitial fluid requirement. So till your interstitial fluid requirement, till the dry parchment paper has again wetted, you have to give crystalloids. The excess fluids may affect it by causing impaired tissue perfusion. And of course, hypertonic saline may cause many things, including hyperchloremic acidosis, etc. Crystalloids and edema, you know, once the interstitial edema has occurred in the alveoli, etc., there'll be impaired gas exchange. There is a limited oxygen availability because of that. And the gut, you know, they develop edema. And gut edema is a harbinger of many major problems. So we don't over-transfuse crystalloids unnecessarily. So isotonic saline, well, using large volumes may cause hyperchloremic acidosis. And this may induce hemostatic defects and may impair urine output. So how much volume is needed to be infused to have relevant changes? So does it matter in routine volumes with shock replaced over a period of time? At least 20 mils 
per kg in a 70 kg person, 1.5 liters, straight away give it. Even the next half liter, two liters. But after that, you have to think. So 1.5 to 2 liters, you can give very fast in smaller stature patients, one liter to one and a half liters, and then think. So colloids and crystallides, albumin, we have these studies, don't believe them. What is that? Albumin can be used, but I, I will not use a Porsche to drive down uh, in a city like Banaras or Shillong where I can't even pick up the speed. I, and I don't have a parking place. So except to show that I have lots of money and I buy albumin and I buy a Porsche, there's no other advantage to that. So start solutions have come up over a period of time. They had problems when they first came in. I remember the literature used to tell that you can have subcutaneous itching, which can last for a year or more because of the tissue distribution in the subcutaneous space. But gradually the uh, molecular size and the molar substitution changed and they got it more or less right in which now you can use larger volumes of the, in the same in a colloid at 130 by 0 0.4 in Daltons. So you will have the, the uh, start solutions and saline. So these are high molecular weight substances. They don't dissolve in water depend on the molecular size, structure, and capillary permeability to remain in the vascular compartment longer than the crystalloids. Now, remember one thing. We have given the colloids. We need two things. One is it should be eliminated. It should be capable of being eliminated by the kidney. What happens when your kidney has gone into a failure and you have already given in? Because we have been late. You know, we waited four hours with, uh, struggling with an 18-gauge uh, cannula, giving crystalloids and then uh, hypotension, we did not call the consultant, we did not take his opinion, and many things happened, and then gradually the acute tubular necrosis sets in, etc. In the meantime, we have got smart enough to give some colloids. Now this colloid is not going out. What will happen? Ultimately, after four to six hours or eight hours, it is going to go across the membrane into the interstitial space, and there it is now like the thief who has entered the house, he is staying there. The ghost has come into the house, you have locked the door, and then you feel a cold, air over your shoulder in the ghost says, now we are both locked in for the rest of the night. So you have this colloid that has gone into the interstitial space. It will have to wait to be eliminated through the chylus channels. So we want that it should be given at a time when the renal function is adequate and it can go out. So we need that it should have a sufficient volume effect. If you have given 50 ml and you want 100 ml total expansion, you don't want plasma accumulation, you want complete renal elimination, you don't want tissue storage, and you want a safety profile as far as coagulation factors, etc., are concerned. So the dextrans, as they came in, there is the development to the 130 molar and the 0.4 uh, substitution. So this optimal combination of molecular weight, degree of substitution, this is what currently we are using in the new generation of starches. So the rationale was that it has preserved the efficacy, improved the pharmacokinetics, minimizes the influence on coagulation, nearly one and a half to two times of the original colloids we can give, and therefore it allows the higher daily doses and therefore increases the safety. It is like, you know, from our old telephone, we have got the mobile and now the slim mobiles and what not. So, here, I have said that we have got the volume effect, which is having lasting for at least three to four hours, and you can give a much higher dose than for the others. So this hydroxyethyl starch at 130 molecular weight and 0.4 molar substitution. So colloids, they also decrease the blood viscosity. Any of you who have worked in acute, with uh, acute normal volumic hemodilution, you find that as you replace the blood for blood with the colloids, there's a fall in viscosity, and viscosity, as it falls, it improves the rheology of the blood, and more the resistance falls, and there is a greater cardiac output, and therefore the oxygen flux in, increases. So therefore, it helps us by improving the microcirculation and improve venous return, and in a healthy heart, it gives an increased preload, which leads to an increased cardiac output. Now, don't do this with a failing heart. So what's good about colloids? There is a volume expansion efficiency, which everybody agrees. So less volume is needed, stays longer, better cardiac response in a healthy heart. 
less tissue edema, better tissue oxygenation, and it has got an anti-inflammatory effect. It's more with mannitol, and, but it is still there with the colloids, and therefore it re reduces the complications. Safety is there, and because anaphylactic reactions now are very less seen with these new colloids. So if the blood volume increases and stays for up to six hours, it modifies the inflammatory response, and we have seen that these beneficial effects improve the microperfusion and reduce the endothelial swelling, and it reduces the erythrocyte aggregation. So it has also a very good effect in that it reduces the increase of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-6 and 8. So a balanced solution, it has been developed, and these contain only 104 millimole of the chloride and reduces the risk of hyperchloremic acidosis. Now, in children, it has been found during open-heart surgery that when they have used it, the fluid balance has been far better with colloids, the ICU stay in days, and the mortality, they have all been reduced. So, colloid preload, if the heart is good, it is okay, provided previously the patient is not dehydrated. Now, you have been using a lot of preload in spinal anesthesia, and you have seen the cardiovascular stability. I don't want to insult your intelligence with anything on that. So, there has, the Cochrane Systematic Review has given us that actually crystalloids are more effective than no fluids. And then colloids are more e effective than crystalloids, but again, if the patient was not grossly dehydrated. So conclusions, initially it was given that crystallite preload is very difficult to achieve quickly without a very big cannula to give that load. Colloid with crystalloid is of benefit. If you have given the colloid along with it, you are giving the crystalloid, that helps you much more. This patient is not dehydrated from the beginning. So colloid preload, uh, the, there is a safety of fluid loading in preeclampsia, this is something that is yet to be kept because the permeability changes in preeclampsia. Be very careful about use of colloids in preeclampsia. So hemodynamic stability is better and when you are giving it for epidural and spinal preload and less amount of ephedrine is needed. In summary, there are differences between the older and newer generation of hydroxyethyl starches. And at present, it is found that the initially whatever the adverse effects on renal perfusion had been function had been talked should not be extrapolated to the newer ones. And here you can see that with colloids, you have got good persistence in the intravascular space. You have got a prolonged stabilization and the volume required is moderate, but it is more expensive. But when you get a prompt response, and this expense, if we say it is expensive, something is costing five rupees, and something is costing six rupees, and something is costing 60,000 rupees. So even the six rupees is costlier than the four rupees. So that way, it is expensive. But it is nothing compared to al albumin. And we need a colloid, and when we need a colloid, that cost is an acceptable alternative. So we have found that the colloid versus crystalloids for fluid resuscitation in critically ill patients, here there is no evidence that colloids are more effective than crystalloids. But the, uh, except for this sepsis condition, and the, where actually the crystalloids seem to score better than the colloids, but for the other conditions, it, for dehydration, for losses, blood losses, for preloading, here it is that colloid scores over crystalloids. So, Colloid should not be used as the sole fluid replacement in resuscitation. Volumes infused should be limited. And in severely ill patients, they principally use crystalloid and blood products as needed. In elective surgical patients, again, physiological heart man and ringer solutions can be very useful. Thank you.